everyone and welcome to the Better Everyday YouTube channel. My name is Randy. So today we are checking out a video from Sam Harris. I have done a couple of reactions to uh, Sam Harris speaking, but it has been a couple of weeks and this is a lecture he did on free will. I'm not watching the whole lecture today. I'm going to watch half of it and then I'll post the reaction to the second half probably next week. I'm excited. So without further ado, here we go. It's an honor to be here. Such a beautiful venue, and and uh, to be following the other uh, horsemen. It's, it really is. It's great to be here. Now I'm going to speak tonight about the delusion of free will. And to my surprise, this is an incredibly sensitive subject. It's perhaps the most sensitive subject I have had the uh, the honor to touch. Uh, it's sensitive to religious people, of course, because without free will. Judaism, Christianity, Islam don't make any sense, if you can imagine such a thing. Uh, but the existence of free will is actually a, a very sensitive topic for atheists as well, because it seems to touch everything human beings care about. It seems to touch everything, in fact, that makes us distinctly human. Morality and law and politics and religion and intimate relationships, feelings of personal accomplishment, feelings of guilt and responsibility. Yeah. It's, it, it seems that most of what we care about in human life depends upon, upon our being able to view other people like ourselves as being the, the actual conscious source of their thoughts and actions. So in this talk, I, I hope to do two things. I hope to convince you that free will is an illusion, and I hope to convince you also that, that, that this matters. And that's a, uh, those are quite distinct. And I want to begin, I hope on not too defensive a note, by telling you the two ways, the two most common ways of misunderstanding my argument. And this is sort of like beginning a marriage proposal by saying, here are the two most common reasons women haven't wanted to marry me. <laughs> and why they were wrong. <laughs> now, the, the first way of missing the point is to think that we, we simply don't understand enough. Science is incomplete. Some of our scientific assumptions may be false. There may be truths to discover about the, the nature of the universe that would put free will, the, the popular notion of free will, on some new footing. So it's, it's simply too soon to say scientifically that free will is an illusion. Th this is not true. This is, I, I am arguing that free will as a concept is, is so incoherent that it can't be mapped onto any conceivable reality. The, the, the second detour you might be tempted to take, as many have, is to say, well, of course, the popular notion of free will doesn't make any sense, it doesn't fit the facts, but not, none of that matters. That's an academic argument. We still feel free. This changes nothing. It's, it's, it's sort of like saying that, that uh, atoms are mostly empty space. You know, this, is, this is not empty space we can use. Nothing about our life changes. You know, everything is mostly empty space, but I still can't fit into an old pair of pants. <laughs> Many people agree that free will doesn't make any sense and that it's some kind of illusion, but they think that nothing important changes. And, and that also, on my view, is untrue. And imagine ta you're taking a nap in the, the botanical garden next door. I don't know if that's legal or not, but just mm -hmm. imagine you do it. And you, you are awakened by an unfamiliar sound, and you open your eyes, and you see a large crocodile about to seize your face in its jaws. Uh, stranger things have probably happened. It should be easy enough to see that you have a problem. Okay. And <laughs> now swap the crocodile for a man uh, holding an ax, the problem changes in some interesting ways, but the, the sudden emergence of free will in the brain of your attacker is not one of them. 
But imagine the difference between these two experiences. Let's say you survive your ordeal, and you, you have a, it's a terrifying experience. Let's say you're injured. Let's say you lose a hand. Okay, now imagine confronting your human attacker on the witness stand during his trial. Okay, if you're like most people, you are going to feel feelings of hatred that could be so intense as to, uh, as to constitute a further trauma. Okay, you, might, you might spend years of your life fantasizing about this person's death. How much time are you going to spend hating the crocodile? I have a question. So I see what he's saying as far as if you wake up and you're being attacked by a crocodile versus you wake up and you're being attacked by someone with an axe, the person's possible free will is really irrelevant if you're being attacked by one or the other because the crocodile, I don't know if he's suggesting, doesn't have free will. Um, and he is saying that if you were attacked by the person, you would fantasize about that person dying, but you probably wouldn't fantasize about that crocodile dying. Well, no, you probably would. But he also mentioned something about being on the witness stand or if the person attacked. If a person, if a human does not have free will, then why go through the trouble of having a trial because we wouldn't have a trial for the crocodile. The crocodile either will just be left alone because it's a crocodile, it's gonna do what it's gonna do, or it will be killed for attacking someone. So if he then is suggesting that the man does not have free will, then either who cares because the man's going to do what the man's going to do and just ax people randomly or just have him killed because it's in his nature. It is not a free will. He's going to do it again, just like the crocodile would do it again. So <laughs> it just... Uh, when he mentioned being on the witness stand and comparing the person to the crocodile, it made me think of that. You, you might even go to the zoo to, to, to take, take your friends and family to the zoo for fun just to look at him. You'd say, though, that is the beast that almost killed me. Yeah, do that with a man. Put him in the zoo. Well, he might be pointing mm. with, with this hand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, which, which state of mind would you rather have? Now, I, I think this, this idea I think that of the man free will help it. largely accounts for the difference. The crocodile was just being a crocodile. Yeah. I mean, what else was a crocodile going to do coming upon you napping in the park? But th this idea that, that the human had free will and could have done otherwise and should have done otherwise has very different consequences. Now, most people imagine that a belief in free will is necessary for morality. Morality has to be grounded in this idea. And it's necessary, for, therefore, for getting most of what we want out of life. And I think that's clearly untrue. We, I, you know, I, the, the difference between happiness and suffering exists with or without free will. I, mean, I no more want to be eaten by a crocodile than I want to be killed by a man with an axe. These are both very good things to avoid. Yeah. Okay, and, we can, and we can avoid them. And we can talk about almost everything else we want in life without suffering any obvious illusions about the origins of human behavior. Now, the, the popular conception of free will seems to rest on two assumptions. Okay, the first is that each of us was free to think and act differently than we did in the past. Yeah. You, you chose A, but you could have chosen B. Okay, you became a policeman, but you could have become a firefighter. You ordered chocolate, or you, you, but you could have ordered vanilla. It, it certainly seems to most of us that this is the world we're living in. Yeah. Now, the, the second assumption is that you are the conscious source of your thoughts and actions. You're, you, you, you feel that you want to move, and then you move. Your conscious desires and intentions and thoughts that precede your actions seem to be their true origin. The conscious part of you that is experiencing your inner life is actually the author of your inner life and your subsequent behavior. Now, unfortunately, we know that both of these assumptions are false. The first problem is that we live in a world of cause and effect. Every 
thing that could co possibly constitute your will is either the product of a long chain of prior causes and you're not responsible for them, or it's the product of randomness and you're not responsible for that, obviously, or it's some combination of the two. And however you turn this dial between the iron law of determinism and mere randomness, free will makes no more sense. I mean, what does it mean to say that a person acted of his own free will? It must mean that he could have consciously done otherwise. Not based on random influences over which he had no control, but because he, as the, the conscious author of his thoughts and actions, could have thought and acted in other ways. Now, the problem is that no one has ever described a way in which mental and physical events could arise that makes sense of this claim. I mean, consider you're a generic murderer. Okay, his, his choice to commit his last murder was preceded by a long series of prior causes, a certain pattern of electrochemical activity in his brain, which was the product of prior causes, some combination of bad genes and the, the developmental effects of an unhappy childhood. Bad genes? Whatever influences were impinging upon him the day he committed his crime. The moment we catch sight of this stream of causes that, that, that precede any conscious experience and reach back into childhood and beyond, or beyond the person's skin into the world, the sense of his culpability disappears, that the place where we would place our blame disappears. To say that he... There is a lot, well, I don't know about people that say free will is a myth, but there are a lot of people who suggest that people are not responsible for their actions. Um, and that's kind of what he is saying here. That's very interesting. Place our blame disappears. To say that he would, he could have done otherwise is really to say he would have been in a different universe had he been in a different universe. Or that he would have been a different person had he been a different person. Now, and, and as disturbing as I might find such a person's behavior, I have to admit that if I, would, if I were to trade places with him, Adam for Adam, I would be him. And I would, I would behave exactly people? as he did. And for the same reasons. There's, there's no extra part of me that could resist the impulse to victimize innocent people. I mean, it, even if you believe that every human being harbors an immortal soul, this, this problem of responsibility remains. I cannot take credit for the fact that I don't have the soul of a psychopath. <laughs> If I had truly been in this person's shoes, if I had an identical brain or, a, or an identical soul in an identical state, I would have behaved exactly as he did. You can't, you can't verify that though. There's no way to verify that claim. You cannot actually do what you just suggest him putting himself in that person's body with that person's mind in that person's situation, yada, 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 yada. So it's an, uh, there's a word for that, like a claim or a hypothesis that can never be verified. There is a word for it, and I can't remember it. So the, so the role of luck in our lives appears decisive. One has to be very unlucky to have the mind and brain or soul of a psychopath. But the moral significance of luck is very difficult to admit. It seems to completely destabilize us. It's a, it, we seem not to know how to think about evil in this context. And yet, in, in specific cases, we have already changed our view of evil. Whenever, whenever we see the cause of someone's behavior, when we see, for instance, that a, a murderer had a brain tumor, and the brain tumor was in just such a place in the brain so as to explain his violent impulses, that person suddenly becomes a victim of biology. Our moral intuitions shift utterly. Now, I'm arguing that a brain tumor is just a special case of physical events giving rise to thoughts and actions. If we, if we fully understood 
the neurophysiology of any murderer's brain, it would be as exculpatory as finding a tumor in it. If we could see how the wrong genes were being relentlessly transcribed, if we could see how his, his early life experience had sculpted the microstructure of his brain in just such a way as to give rise to, to violent impulses, the, the, the whole con conception of placing blame on him would erode. Now, of course, this is a problem that scientists and philosophers are, are aware of, and many think they have put forward a, a notion of free will that can, that can uh, withstand the, um, the facts. And I'll deal with some of that. There appears to be a poltergeist in this computer. Uh, but I want, to, I want to argue for a moment that the, the problem of free will is actually deeper than the problem of cause and effect. I mean, most people think we have this experience of free will and simply, simply we can't map it on to physical reality. I think this is an illusion. The, the, the free will doesn't even correspond to a subjective fact about ourselves. And if you pay close attention to your experience, you can see this. Your, your thoughts simply appear in consciousness very much like my words. What, what are you going to think next? What am I going to say next? I could, I could start just wondering about why we don't eat owls. Why don't we eat owls? They seem perfectly good. Good question. Where did that come from? Well, as far as you're concerned, it came out of nowhere. Right, but the same thing happens in the privacy of your own mind. It's, it's happening right now. You, you've all made an effort to be here tonight, presumably because you wanted to hear what I had to say about free will. And you're, you're trying to listen to me, but you have a voice in your head <laughs> that just says things. <laughs> Haven't you noticed? Now, I'm standing up here trying to reason with you, and you'll think, he looks a little like Ben Stiller. Somebody said that in the comments to the last thing I reacted to from Sam Harris. I thought it was funny. I was hoping I didn't look that much like Ben Stiller. A little bit. Thoughts just emerge in consciousness. We are, we are not authoring them. We, we can't think them, we can't choose them before we think them. That would require that we think them before we think them. Chicken and egg situation there. If you can't control your next thought and you don't know what it's going to be until it appears, where is your freedom of will? Now, at this moment, some of you are thinking, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> Here's what I'm talking about. You didn't choose that thought either. If, if you're confused by what I'm saying, you didn't create that state. Conversely, if you, if you understand what I'm saying and you find it interesting, you didn't create that either. Everything is just happening. And that includes your thoughts and intentions and desires and your most deliberate efforts. We will come back to that point. Uh -huh. So as of right now, I'm going to pause just for a second. He speaks of free will, talking about perhaps like someone who kills a person and m maybe in some situations the murder can be attributed in part to a brain tumor that was causing... Um, impulse control issues, but you know, there are lots of murderers that don't have brain tumors. But now he is speaking about the thoughts, your consciousness, the thoughts that pop into your head. Where is the free will if you don't determine what the next thoughts are that pop into your head? But I think with the free will, I don't really necessarily think about that voice in your head. I, in my own perspective, I would view those as separate 
things that maybe collaborate. I don't know. But to me, free will is action. Not the voice in your head. Um, I tried to control the voice in my head when I was like 13. And I was like, that's pointless. Not that quickly. I tried for a while. Anyway, uh, moving on. Now, of course, in a sense, your brain, our brains, do think our thoughts before we think. Because there's a lot of thoughts you don't want. We never hear about. A lot. We're, we're conscious of only a tiny fraction of what goes on in, in our minds. And we, we continually notice changes in our experience, in thoughts and intentions and moods and resulting behavior. But we are utterly unaware of the, the neurophysiological changes that, that produce those, those, those changes. I mean, consider the sensation of, of touching your finger to your nose. Okay, feel free to try this. It seems simultaneous. It seems like the nose touches the finger at the same time the fi finger touches the nose. Okay. And, w and while it may be simultaneous in the, w in the world, we know at the level of the brain the timing has to be different. It simply takes longer for the input from the fingertip to reach sensory cortex than it does from the nose. And this is true no matter how short your arms or long your nose. Your <laughs> new arms. So the experience of the present moment, even of the simplest sensation, is built upon layers of unconscious processing that we're not aware of. Okay, so, so even the apparently simple conscious events are not entirely what they seem. The, 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 the present moment is, in some sense, already a memory that is being buffered. <laughs> now, needless to say, this unconscious mach machinery produces not only our perceptions, but our thoughts, intentions, actions, decisions. And this is where the notion of free will and moral responsibility begin to get squeezed. Now, many people have demonstrated in a lab, in many labs actually, that, that a person's conscious decision comes after processes that can be detected. And there is a, there is a time lag between the moment you think you've decided to do something and the moment at which your brain decided. And this has been proven, Benjamin Labette did this with uh, EEG, and this has been done with fMRI, and, and actually direct recordings from the, the, the cortices of, of patients under, about to undergo surgery. We know that the, even the simplest, most apparently voluntary decision, like the decision to move your left hand versus your right hand, or the decision to, to push the left button or the right button, uh, when you put people in this paradigm and you have them watch a clock, a special clock that allows them to discriminate just you know, very fine uh, increments of time, and you ask them simply to, to make the choice to move whenever they want to, they can move their left hand or the right hand, just notice when it, what time it was on the clock when you finally were aware of which course you were going to take. We know that, that some moments, half a second, sometimes as much as five seconds, before a person is consciously aware of what they're going to do, we can see in the brain what they were committed to doing. So it, it, the, the experience of deciding is, during this period where you still feel that you are free to do anything you want has already been de determined by the state of your brain. So needless to say, this time lag is very difficult to reconcile with free One thing, too, I would have to read what he's talking about. I've never read any of that, but that's interesting. But even just like with the nose and the finger, and one of those takes longer, the timing may not be something that can easily be measured. Like he was saying, they were measuring somebody watching a clock and then choosing to press a button and their brain maybe showed activity before they consciously re recognized that that was the activity they were doing. Perhaps there was a lag that they were sim simultaneous, but there was actually a lag in the communication of that person's consciousness, if that makes sense. That's just a thought. So needless to say, this time lag is very difficult to reconcile with free will because in principle it would allow someone to predict what you're going to do while you still think you're making up your mind. But the truth is, is that even if there were no time lag, even if 
the conscious intention were truly simultaneous with the neurophysiological underpinnings, there would still be no room for free will because you still wouldn't know why it is you do what you do in that moment. And again, you can notice this fact about yourself directly. But let's run a little experiment. Think of a film, any film, it doesn't matter, a good one, a bad one. And notice what your conscious process of selection is like. Notice first that you're, you're, this is as free a decision as you're ever going to get. I mean, you're, you have all the films in the world to choose from, and I've simply said, pick one. Does everybody have a film? I'm sorry to say you've all picked the wrong film, so don't ask me how I know that, but I do. Do it again. Pick another film, and, and just be sensitive to what the, the experience is like. Do you see any evidence for free will there? Let's, let's look for it. First, if it's not here, it's not anywhere, so we better be able to find it here. First, let's rule out all of those films whose names you don't know and which you haven't seen and which you couldn't have possibly thought of if your life depended on it. Okay. There's no freedom in that, obviously. But then there are all these other films which you're perfectly aware of, but which simply didn't come to consciousness. You, you absolutely know that The Wizard of Oz is a film, but you just didn't think of The Wizard of Oz. Now think about this. Were you free to choose that which did not occur to you to choose? For, for whatever reason, your, your Wizard of Oz circuits were not primed in such a way as to deliver it as a possibility. Of course, if you did think of the Wizard of Oz, you should consider yourself a genius. <laughs> okay, so you probably thought of several films. Okay, and let's say you thought of Lawrence of Arabia and Avatar and Mad Max. Okay, so you kind of converged on those three, and then you thought, well, I'm... Australian, I'll go with Mad Max. And then you thought, no, no, Mel Gibson is more than a little creepy at this point in his life. <laughs> so I'm going to go with Avatar. Okay. And you settle on Avatar. Well, well, you still don't know why you chose Avatar over Lawrence of Arabia. Okay. And, and this, is the, this is the sort of decision that motivates the idea of free will. You go back and forth between two options and you're not suffering any obvious constraints from the external world or any coercion. It just, you appear to be doing all of it. It's just you and your thoughts. But when you look close, closely, this is, it is a mystery why you chose one over the other. And you, you might have a story to tell about it. You might say, well, I saw a, an animated movie last week and Avatar's animated, so I, I remembered that, and so I just went with Avatar. Okay, well, the first thing to say is that we know that those sorts of explanations are almost always wrong. When you bring people into the lab and manipulate their decisions, they always have a story about why they did what they did, and it never bears any relationship to what actually influenced them. So you, you can bring people into the lab and, and give them a hot beverage as opposed to a cold one to hold in their hands and get them to cooperate more or to like one person more than another, and they have no idea that the, the temperature of the cup in their hands is influencing them at all. The psychology is just bursting with, with evidence of that kind. But even if you're right in this case, even if, even if the memory of the animated film was the thing that steered you to Avatar over Lawrence of Arabia, you still can't explain why it had that effect. Why did it have the opposite effect? Why didn't, why didn't you think, well, I, I just saw an animated film, so I'm going to go with something else. I'll go with Lawrence of Arabia. The, the thing to notice about this is that, that you, the conscious witness of your inner life, isn't making these decisions. All you can do is witness these decisions. I mean, you, you no more picked a film in the subjective sense than you would have if I 
picked it for you. I, I could have been saying Star Wars, Hannah and her sisters. The, these, these names were just appearing in consciousness. There was, there was this first moment where I said, pick a film, and nothing had happened, and then all of a sudden, the names of films started coming to you. In my mind, the film I went to, the first one, I was trying to come up with names I remembered uh, that were fresh in my mind, movies I watched recently. And so my mind pro prose like 10 recent memories. And I was like, oh yes, that was my favorite of those things. That was my connection. Um, but in some ways, it, as me listening to him, which I'm not a psychologist, I do like to read um, studies, um, scientific research from different areas, but I'm not familiar specifically with his work. But to some degree, I see it as something that cannot be, um, cannot be observed and measured and completely understood by the scientific slash psychological community so therefore it does not exist um, at a time um, planets in outer space didn't exist if that makes sense so that's I'm not saying he's wrong I'm just saying we only know what we know and so there are a lot of things that cannot be explained but it Based on what he has said so far, he cannot prove that it does not exist. He's theorizing that it does not exist and telling us why, and I understand his why, but um, there are other things like free will, that's what he's speaking about, but that's not the only thing that has ever been proposed to have not existed because it cannot be understood, it cannot be measured, or there has been a study or two to suggest that it doesn't. There are studies to suggest a lot of things, and, well, I don't know about every single field, but in a lot of things that I have read, there are studies that directly contradict one another. These studies, findings, will suggest that this is wrong and this is right, but then these studies suggest the direct opposite. But what he's saying is interesting, um, nonetheless. And you didn't know which they would be until they appeared. So I'm arguing to you that, that our experience in life is actually totally compatible with the truth of determinism. We don't have this robust sense of free will the moment we actually pay attention to how thoughts and intentions arise. Also, it's a little depressing, the idea of... You're just going through the motions that you have no decision in any of it. That is extremely depressing. And again, it's important to notice that this is true whether or not we have immortal souls. And there's no, the case I'm building against free will does not presuppose philosophical materialism. I'm not, the, the idea that reality is just entirely physical. No doubt. Most of reality is entirely physical, and most of mind is, is produced by physical changes in our brains. We know that the brain is a physical system that's entirely beholden to the laws of nature. But even if we have souls that are somehow loosely integrated with the brain, the unconscious operation of a soul grants you no more free will than the unconscious neurophysiology of your brain does. If you don't know what your soul is going to do next, you are not in control of your soul. And th this is rather starkly obvious when you think of all of the people who do things they wish they hadn't done. I mean, think of the, the millions of, of Christians whose souls just happen to be gay. But it's true even when you do exactly what you wish you had done in hindsight. It, the soul that allows you to stay on your diet is just as mysterious as the soul that tempts you to eat cherry pie for breakfast. 
Okay, so I think it's safe to say that no one has ever argued for the existence the of free will because it holds such promise as an abstract idea. The, the, the endurance of this problem in science and philosophy is the result of, of this feeling that most of us have that we freely author our thoughts and actions. Perhaps not our thoughts. And the, Let the me know in the, the comments because I don't want to <clears throat> misunderstand what he's saying. It would have been helpful if he had defined uh, some of his terms like free will. What exactly he was that term when he said for, for, says free will. What does that consist of? And this does that include thoughts and actions? Is that what he means? I don't know if I've heard free will used in a way that referenced both actions and thoughts. To some degree, thoughts, for sure. But there are these, like, in, instinctual thoughts or perhaps things built in that pop into our heads that you have to push away. And I don't know anybody who hasn't. Things that you have to kind of suppress. Or, for example, diets. I was 300 pounds when I was 18. I did a lot of different diets. And... There were impulses, you know, things that fired up certain parts of me, like, eat this, eat this, and perhaps gave in, perhaps not, but eventually reining that in, and obviously not being 300 pounds anymore. But at this moment, unless you tell me in the comments otherwise, I am going to assume for the rest of this that when he says free will, he is including your the voice in your head that often brings up thoughts that you have absolutely no control over, just default knee-jerk thoughts, some of which you probably would never, never tell anyone. Tell me if I'm wrong, but myself and, like I said, pretty much most people I've talked to about those knee-jerk thoughts, there will be things that are just sh shameful and you, you don't you just want those out of your mind as quickly as possible um so when he says free will i feel like he means those as well which i i haven't studied free will from a psychology perspective but i wouldn't think that that would be considered to be part of free will that would be like your neurons the things just that are automatically sent right there to your your conscious mind, you know, before you were able to kind of analyze and sort through those. I don't want you. I'll look at you a little closer. You need to get out as well. Um, Our thoughts and actions. And the, at the moment, the only philosophically respectable way to defend free will is to adopt a view in academic philosophy that's called compatibilism and to argue that, that, that free will is compatible with the truth of determinism. Now, my, my friend Dan Dennett is a, uh, the philosopher is a, is a compatibilist, and he essentially makes the claim that we just have to think about free will differently. Free, if, if, if a murderer commits his crime based on his desire to kill and not based on some other thing that's hijacking him, but his actions are actually an expression of his real desires and intentions, well, then that's all the free will you need. But from both a, a moral and scientific point of view, this seems to miss the point. But where is the freedom in doing what one wants when, one, when one's desires are the product of prior events that one is completely unaware of and had no hand in creating? Don't give in to all of your desires. So from my point of view, compatibilism is, is a little like saying a puppet is free as long as it loves its strings. Now, compatibilists push back here. They say that, that even if our desires and thoughts and behavior are the product of unconscious causes, that doesn't matter because you're, you're, you are the totality of what goes on inside your brain and body. So your, your unconscious mental life, mental life is just as much you and your unconscious neurophysiology is just as much you as your conscious inner life is. Okay, but this, to my eyes, seems like a bait and switch. Okay, this, this trades a psychological fact, this experience we have of consciously authoring 
our thoughts and actions. For a, a general conception of ourselves as persons, it's, it's a little like saying you are made of stardust, okay, which you are, but you don't feel like stardust. And, and, and the, the knowledge that you're a stardust is not driving your moral intuitions and influ influencing our, our system of criminal justice. The, the fact is, is that m most people are I identified with a certain channel of information in their conscious minds. They feel that they are in control, they are the source, and this is an illusion. The, the you that you take yourself to be in this present moment isn't in control of anything. So compatibilists try, try to save free will by, by saying you're more than this. You are the totality of what goes on inside your brain and body. But you're making decisions right now with, with organs other than your brain. But you don't feel responsible for these decisions. Are you making red blood cells right now? Your body is doing this, hopefully. But if it, if it were to stop, you wouldn't be responsible for this. You would be the victim of this change. So, so to say that, that, that you That makes me think of, like, imagine driving a car. You are, you are the driver. You are not actively doing whatever is happening in the engine, firing the engine that is happening because it's built into the car that you're driving. So separate those things. But he is saying more like you are not thinking about the fact that you are... For example, your heart is beating, something like that. If it stopped beating, kind of like if the vehicle stopped working. So, so to say that, that you are responsible or, or, or are identical to everything that goes on inside your brain and body is to make a claim about you that bears absolutely no relationship to the experience of conscious authorship and subjectivity that has made free will a problem for philosophy in the first place. He's pausing, so I'm going to pause it here because we're so a little what? over halfway. So when I watch next time, I will, I will back it up to about right here. It's definitely interesting. I didn't know what to expect, but I definitely didn't expect where he's going with it. Um, just like most of the people I listen to on this channel, some of the things that he said I disagree with, but even so, I still find it very interesting because it's not something that I have looked into myself, but, um, yeah, I look forward to watching the rest of it. Let me know what you thought of his discussion so far and, um, if there's anything I should look out for next time, if I should take notes, if you want me to speak less, speak more. Whatever. Um, let me know in the comments and I will comments and I will see you next time. Have a good one.